Today is the Malcolm Chaikin Oration, and it is presented annually by an outstanding technologist and educator who has contributed to society in the Chaikin tradition. And this is 10 years, so this is a very special one. This is the 10th, the 10th event. Chaikin Medal is presented to the orator as a vote of thanks on behalf of the New South Wales Division. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's recipient, today's recipient, and to present the medal to Cathy Foley, Dr. Cathy Foley, AO, TSN, FTSE, FAA, Chief Scientist Australia. Hold it, I need to say something about me first. <laughs> Dr. Foley was, was appointed as Australia's Chief Scientist in January 2021, following a long and distinguished career at CSIRO, including as that agency's Chief Scientist. She's an internationally recognised physicist with major research achievements in superconductors and sensors, which led to the development of the Lantern sensor system to locate valuable deposits of minerals deep underground. And that resulted in discoveries and, and um, detection of minerals worth more than $6 billion. That's a huge achievement. So Dr. Foley's scientific excellence and influential leadership have been recognised with numerous awards and fellowships including election to the Australian Academy of Science in 2020, an award of the Order of Australia for Service to Research Science and to the Advancement of Women in Physics in 2020. She's a Fellow of the Australian Academy of APTI and an Honorary Fellow of the Australian Institute of Physics in 2019. And in 2013, she was named Woman of the Year by the New South Wales Government. So as well as advancing scientific research, She's held various roles, including, as I said, um, a division chief in CSIRO, but she's also been a member of the Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council, President of the Australian Institute of Physics, and President of Science and Technology Australia. So an amazing track record. So Dr. Foley, Patty, is an inspiration to women in STEM across the globe and is committed to tackling gender equality and diversity in the science sector to embrace the full human potential for everyone. So I am thrilled to present the 2021, that's because it's been held last year, the 2021 Cheka Narration Medal to Dr. Cathy Foley in recognition of her sustained contribution to the next generation research, technology, education, and science strategy for the future. Please welcome Cathy Foley. <laughs> so now, Kathy will address us. So, right. yes, firstly, we just need a picture of Paul. Oh, okay. Here we go. Right. This is where. Okay. Here we go. Right. This is where. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, Kathy will speak on a lifetime of preparation. <laughs> so, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. Anne, and thank you for inviting me uh, to speak today. But I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands we're all coming from today. And as we know, we're in Sydney here, so we're on the lands of the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I want to pay my respects to them and to the traditional custodians of other lands where audience members are, are based when they're online. I want to acknowledge those who have been uh, caring for the, the lands, but also the ones who've come before and the young ones who are going to follow. It's an honour to be acknowledged alongside with other many esteemed recipients. And just to remind you who some of the past recipients are in 2020, uh, the Honourable John Anderson, who is a former uh, Deputy Prime Minister uh, who addressed the challenges of the looming global food crisis. In 2017, the recipient was Professor Chris Roberts AO, who's a Plus Alliance professor and spoke from um, and about Australia's world-class hearing ecosystem. And then in 2014, recipient was, a professor, was Professor Mary O'Kane, who we all know as uh, the former New South Wales Chief Scientist and Engineer, whose oration focused on examining the often overlooked innovation system factors to address the productivity of, and of the growth problem. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the, some of the guests here today to the Honourable Gabrielle Upton, who's the Parliamentary Secretary to the Premier. It's always great to work with you. 
and Professor Andrew Parford, who's a Vice Chancellor of the University of Technology, Sydney, who I think we were sort of at CSRO together at one stage as early career researchers, so we all grow up. Um, uh, Dr. Susan Pond, <laughs> AM, who's the President of the Royal Society of New South Wales. And also, of course, the members of the Chaikin family who are here today, and Mrs. Lynn Chaikin, it's so great that you're here. Uh, son, David, um, uh, daughters, Katrina, Gwen, Elizabeth, and her husband, Philip Porter. So thank you so much for coming today. So I've been asked to speak about what I've learned so far in my role as Australia's chief scientist. Well, like all of us during the pandemic, I've learned a lot of things about the intricacies of navigating online meeting platforms. <laughs> and so it's uh, actually great to be here in person. I've also learned how to optimize my driving route uh, to Sydney Airport to catch the early flight to Canberra. <laughs> and I've also learned about what I'll describe as the three R's in government. These are, and give me a little bit of poetic, poetic license here, the reality that government, either big or small, is reactive to situations completely outside their control. And this has been most strikingly demonstrated by the challenges we've collectively faced recently, both domestically and globally, over the last few years and even happening now. The government is also required to manage risk. Risk is part of everything we do. It's complex and the pace of change is increasing, which even adds to that more. And the government must be responsive, delivering with flexibility, quality and assuredness to sharp deadlines. The research world, as you'll know, can be quite different on all these different levels. Research works more slowly, and in many cases, decades more slowly. Research, discovery and innovation have their own rhythms that don't always align with those of government policy. I'd also venture to say that science and the research system has a different relationship with risk. In many ways, risk is inherent to the process of science, is deeply embedded in discovery, which is all about untested ideas, trying something out, hitting dead ends and trying again. There are many areas of government where that level of ambiguity and uncertainty would not match in uh, community expectations. But I've also learned that there are some aspects these worlds of research, innovation and government have in common. There is enormous goodwill throughout the ecosystem. We're in a world hungry for science and technology and looking for ways to realize the potential. And there are a lot of people like yourselves looking for solutions to global challenges. As I was preparing to speak with you today, I actually reflected on the legacy of Malcolm Chaker a scientist with a drive to solve real world problems. And I understand he was a CSIRO employee only briefly in the 1950s before his long uh, distinguished academic career. I started at CSIRO 30 years later, so we were a long way from overlapping, but we do have one aspect of our careers in common. Professor Chaikin was a textiles expert. I read one of his patents that he filed. Uh, this was one from 1966 for a machine that would improve the efficiency and speed of combing of wool fibers. Now, I'm not going to attempt to explain it in more detail than that, but I'll suffice to say, as with all patterns, the description runs to 220 words in a single sentence. <laughs> At CSIRO, I too found myself responsible for all the work in textiles. In 2010, I was appointed as the chief of the material science and engineering division, which looked after that area. When I started the job, I remember, re, remember wondering why some of the staff appeared to be zipping off to Italy all the time. Well, apart from the obvious, um, it turns out there was a good reason. And this story will bring me to the point I wanna to make today. If you remember the 1970s, you'll remember the woolen jumpers. Although actually, yeah, probably around here, we're mostly, everyone was here in the 1970s, but there were some who probably may not know this. They were bulky and awkward in many ways, you know, scratchy, downright difficult things to wear. Synthetic fibres, they'd hit the mass market and they were proving to be popular and they presented a real threat for Australia's wool producers. Wool had to stage a fight back, but how? In the 1970s, the wool industry faced problems. 
Synthetic fibers were sold on the basis of an objective measurement of fineness and length. But wool had no objective measurement of fineness. There was no way of saying for sure or guaranteeing to a standard that would meet the commercial needs. How fine fibers could be given in a single bundle. It wasn't a complete mystery. The bales were assessed by professionals, but that was done by human eye. It was a subjective assessment by, made by buyers who looked at the fibers at the top of each bale. This system had served its purpose. But how can you exploit the true value of merino grown here without being able to give evidence-based assurances to the buyers about quality, fineness, and consistency? Thus was born the Australian Objective Measurement Project. This was a major collaborative effort across not only the CSIRO, but with our universities and the wool industry. They created an evidence base that directly correlated the grading of raw fiber with the end product. This made wool less commercially risky and allowed us to realize the premium price. The second part of the equation was making the processing side of textiles more efficient, automating the cleaning, dyeing, the manufacturing process to keep wool competitive against synthetics. This technology was actually adopted by the Italian textiles industry. So that explained the trips to Italy. So what's my point? Well, now I stand here today wearing my favorite merino suit and I do find it beautifully comfortable. But this story also illustrates the principle that in science, you really have to understand something or you don't really understand it unless you can measure it. And the corollary is that you have to know what you're measuring and that it's the right thing. So starting a new role is challenging for anyone. And the first thing I noticed in my role as Australia's chief scientist was actually working in an office block that didn't have any laboratories. Um, and um, one of the biggest transitions was actually recognizing the lack of access to academic literature when it was um, previously at my fingertips. How can you be chief scientist if you don't have access to the latest literature? My role as Australia's chief scientist is to ensure Australia has access to high caliber, independent and authoritative scientific and technology advice. There is immense opportunity in working across the science and technology landscape, choosing uh, to focus on key areas that solve challenges. How better to link up research innovation uh, and industry and governments so we can improve the pull through of our world leading research to impact? How to increase the number of people with STEM qualifications? how to build the high tech workforce so that Australia can realize its ambitious agenda in new low emissions industries and in digital, quantum, space and other emerging industries and exploring the potential for national open access strategy to improve industry, government and public accessibility to research literature. This will assist with increasing innovation outcomes and combating misinformation to create a more informed and engaged society and of course, there's no self-interest here. I suspect you know what I'm gonna say next. You can't solve those problems unless you can measure them and get the measurements right. Except I'm not talking about length and fineness of wool on a sheep's back. The measurements I'm talking about are the data we use for, to measure innovation and compare innovation internationally. The data we use to measure commercialization the data we use to measure university rankings, the data we use to measure the success of individual researchers. The current approach is no longer working for us. Innovation systems are dynamic, interconnected. Many metrics have focused on measuring R&D, but R&D data doesn't capture all innovation since not every innovation is the result of a scientific breakthrough. For example, it is increasingly important to measure digital activities in the economy. The digital innovation and take up is not adequately captured in measures of innovation. There is significant focus on commercialization of public research and counting startups, but this too fails to recognize what most commercialized ha ha commercialization happens within businesses, and that's called intrapreneurship. Internationally, the inputs to various commercialization indices differ between countries, which makes comparisons less than enlightening. 
And when you consider how to measure the work of universities, you run into the same sorts of complexities. Universities are extraordinary institutions that have many different roles. And there are many different ways of measuring what happens within them. Measurements of industry engagement, for example, which are used are fairly blunt. International rankings drive behavior and priorities in the university sector, but the parameters used can be quite narrow. Even within research institutions, the incentives operate to encourage a sort of kind of version of Hunger Games. Citations, publication numbers, grants, bonuses for publishing in nature and science. Now these are good journals, I don't wanna put them down, but they're not the only ones. And they're not necessarily the best for every discipline. In the case of citations, I actually have my own experience about how strange things can get. And I'll tell you this apocryphal tale now. My most highly cited paper actually relates to work of a really unnecessary debate about a very exciting area, which I know you know all about, uh, the band gap of indium nitride. Uh, there was so much debate and there were so many papers about this one number. And I often think all of that could have been headed off. If I just added that extra chapter to my PhD, which I now realize actually contained the answer. But as with all PhDs, I ran out of time. So I had that unpublished chapter. The result was lots of citations and that was really good for my research ranking, but it actually had no, advan no contribution to the advancement in science. And you've probably all heard of cases where papers have sh been shown to be wrong but continue to be cited over and over despite being discredited. Here's another example, Professor Genevieve Bell. She's the director of the School of Cybernetics and the um, 3A Institute at ANU. She's also vice president or, or has been uh, of R&D at Intel Corporation and such an inspiration to the world of technology and a fellow of ATSI. Uh, and uh, so much important work in the academic field. Um, but because of the gap she has with being in industry, she actually laments that she's not competitive in the ARC funding rounds. She said, I was allowed to tell you that. <laughs> Considered from another perspective, names on academic papers are still an important part of attribution, credit and accountability. But it can get silly um, when author list runs to tens, hundreds, even thousands of people. And this uh, is what happens when the incentives are not driving the outcomes we're seeking. My predecessor, Alan Finkel, described metrics as like the tendrils of wisteria, winding their way right through the research ecosystem, from hiring and promotion to funding to publication, not always with benign outcomes because of those perverse incentives that can start to shape and control the way research, the research sector works. I view those tendrils of wisteria in evolutionary terms. The way we rank individuals and institutions has evolved over time and arise out of cultural, historical practices and systems. Unlike Darwinian evolution itself, the result is not always optimal. There are many living things that you would design differently if you were working backwards and starting from scratch. So let me give you an example here. I'm told that hiccups serve no purpose at all. And I understand that hiccups had a purpose for our ocean living ancestors. Now science wasn't sure why we hiccup and it's possible the answer is for no reason at all, at least not for the last 400 million years. <laughs> Nevertheless, we hiccup, that's evolution in action. When I think about metrics, we need to think about what purpose they are serving and whether they meet the needs now and for the future. To answer that question, we need to ask another one. What do we want to achieve? From where I stand, the answers to those questions are support and grow our research sector, kickstart high tech industry and manufacturing here in Australia, solve some big technology problems, including climate and low emissions technologies, become world leaders in emerging sectors such as quantum and space and to make sure we're funding the best and brightest to undertake fundamental research, coming up with the answers to questions we haven't even asked yet. This is what we want to achieve. And these things can only happen if we cultivate the STEM skills in our young people, encouraging more young minds into science, technology, engineering, and related fields, 
in substantially growing the STEM workforce. There is such a demand for a workforce trained in science, maths and engineering with digital skills in areas such as quantum and artificial intelligence. There is an urgent need in the wider workforce in the spheres of, for example, design, law and policy making to be digitally literate, recognising that STEM is pervasive in every aspect of our society. And it starts with education, the education system, where we must ensure our school and tertiary graduates are equipped with the foundational skills and can see clear career pathways ahead. The responsibility to develop these pathways does not just rest only on the shoulders of our teachers, but it needs the input of the emerging industries and our research and our innovation leaders. You may have heard me say this before, we need the language of quantum to be part of our kids' backpacks, just like log tables and Pythagorean triangles uh, were part of our vocab at school. I can say that because we're mostly a bit older here. Um, whether or not um, they ended up, or none of it, very few of us ended up being mathematicians. And this is really the nub of it. How do we grow the STEM workforce? Well, in um, some simple terms, it says widen the pool which means encouraging more women to study STEM and supporting them through their STEM careers. It also means using our full human potential, including older workers through micro-credentialing and on-the-job training. And it means making it easier for people to move between different sectors of research, industry and startups. The data on women's involvement in STEM is not good at all. More women than men are enrolled in tertiary education. But STEM subjects, the ratio is uh, reversed quite dramatically. Let me give you some numbers. More than a third of men in tertiary education are studying STEM, uh, STEM qualifications. In, that's areas related to maths, sciences, or engineering, but it is excluding health. For women, the figure is only 9%. The most recent STEM equity monitor shows that the proportion of women across all STEM qualified industries sat at 28% in, in 2020. In le electrical engineering, just 7% of the workforce is female. And the figure is even worse in mechanical and industrial engineering, where just 5% of the workforce is female. When I talk to women in science about the reasons for this, it becomes clear that current research metrics are a real roadblock. For many women, those important early career years coincide with having children, and the time away from their research can negatively impact their publication, funding and citation records, setting them back in disproportionate ways. A similar problem occurs for people who follow science and technology careers that are not recognised by traditional measures. We're using volume as a measure for energy. We don't have a metric for measuring mentoring, and there are too many de-mentors in the research sector. Scientists should not be disadvantaged by working in industry or government. And these options should advance careers, not set them back. Where, and where are the collaboration metrics? I always find it a bit ironic that when you tackle a science problem, one of the first things to resolve is the measurements, making sure you're measuring the right thing. And when you get um, there and, and, and we start measuring our own careers, we use metrics that, in my view, are only marginally useful. This is a difficult question, but it's an important one which we shouldn't shy away from. The sad reality is we've been talking about this for years. Right now, our country is building its future on high-tech STEM-related industries. This is our opportunity. As many of us have recognised, the time has come to be disruptive and open to transformative changes. Right now, we're navigating a number of profound challenges, a pandemic, supply chain issues, and unfortunately a war. The pace of digital change and, re and social response to these challenges has been more rapid than ever before. We cannot stand still. Never has there been more, a more relevant time to be responsive in the face of disruption. It is all around us, and we need to be flexible and adapt. One of the problems I see is the people who must lead this change are those, you and me, have actually benefited from the status quo. We've developed our careers within the current system and learned to operate within its rules. 
A new normal requires both you and me to lean into discomfort. And I'm pleased to see this is starting to happen. You might have seen the recent communique from the NHNMRC calling for feedback on a range of significant changes to their granting scheme. They're aiming to improve the funding success of women, including what might seem uncomfortable ideas such as, dare I say, quotas or separate grant schemes and structural changes to peer review. I've heard other ideas to recognise in-kind contributions to research efforts, such as a way to tokenise those contributions. So just before I finish, I want to draw attention to one ambitious priority I'm working on. This is opening our publishing system to provide better access to our research literature. My aim is a model that will allow all Australians to read research literature openly, whether you work in industry or government, research institutions, hospitals, schools, even the general public. This is a transformative change that challenges the status quo. So it's not without risk. It's complex and it won't happen overnight. But we have started the conversation and we're doing the groundwork to understand the system and consider the best way forward. And here's another thing I've learned. I've learned that Australia, as Australia's chief scientist, transformative changes like this are available to me. This is where I can make a difference. But the contribution I can make is one of leadership and focus. The changes in culture and practice are for all of us to make. If we do move to an open access system for research literature, it is up to industry, government, researchers and innovators to make the best use of it and find and use the opportunity. Back in 2001, it's a few years ago now, I heard Ian Chubb talk about his efforts to get industry support for a new government innovation plan. The plan would deliver more money for research, focus on STEM skills and innovation hubs and make R&D tax changes. Inspired by the partnership approach in the US between industry, research and government, Professor Chubb wanted to see a letter of support from industry, but he couldn't find one corporate leader to sign. He described their hesitancy as, and I'll quote here, timidity beyond belief. We cannot afford timidity if we're going to shake up the status quo, nor is it helpful to be defeatist. Yes, we have been having this conversation about better ways of connecting up the system for a long time, but that doesn't make it a hopeless one. Now, I started talking about the different approaches to risk. I suggested that scientists live and breathe risk as inherent to the process of discovery. And in government, it's part of the job to manage risk. But in truth, there is no dichotomy. Risk is part of everything we do. Taking risk, but also managing and balancing risk. No one's going to be asking anyone to jump out of an aeroplane without a parachute. Risk is not about, only about discovery and experimentation and research. It's about entrepreneurialism and commercialization, innovation and fresh thinking. It's about challenging our comfort, shaking up the things that have been done and ask, can they be done better? The task or the case for change builds over time. And when the stars align, it happens. Consider the development of mRNA vaccine um, technology. It was a long time in the making. It took a pandemic to create an imperative and focus disruptive force to make it happen. We have an opportunity now. Just as the challenge of synthetic textiles spurred research and improvement in new ways of doing things and new systems of measurement in the wool industry, we have a moment in time to make a difference now. It is open to all of you to challenge your comfort and to join me in taking action. Take Merino as our model rather than the accident of hiccups. There is, as I said, a hunger for new ideas and new ways of doing things. There is an appetite for research, science and innovation. It's up to us as a community to take this opportunity and to use it to invent an excellent machine that is fit for purpose. So thanks very much. Wow, that was fantastic. Thought-provoking. I really like your open access project. Um, so we're going to now do questions. Peter's going to manage questions in the room and Aidy will 
hopefully manage questions online. We have some? Not yet, okay. Um, and I will take, I'll be the microphone lady. <laughs> and just, just as a matter of help, I'm not sure, Amy, if everyone can hear the question around the room. So, Kathy, if you could repeat the question. Do, in short. Yes. Yeah. So, Gabriel, if you would like to make a comment question. I thought we're actually inviting Gabriel to the microphone. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. What a pleasure to be here and to hear from our chief scientist, who is such a plain speaking, brilliant, innovative, disrupting in her thinking leader in our country, regardless of gender, but we <laughs> celebrate that as well. I was interested in your early comments about maybe the, the kind of predisposition of government versus researchers in science and innovation. And I suppose what I have learned to build as a narrative around that to, um, and Richard Sheldrake would appreciate this as a former very senior bureaucrat in government, is to talk the language of bureaucrats with the greatest of respect, Richard, which is to talk about an alignment of government approach to things with the stakeholder who you're wanting to support. And the argument that I prosecuted is that in fact, government should have a time sequence and appetite that's similar to innovation and research outcomes that you talk about. Because we have patient capital. Mm -hmm. We, um, yes, we do think to electoral cycles, but the best and strongest good policy response to something beyond that. So there's actually more alignment, I suppose, so I make that first point, there's more of alignment between our thinking and government, if that argument is strongly made by everybody in this room and others, than you might think, because I do believe good policy comes from there. So I was just interested in any comments um, from your experience of over a year now in your role, and I commend you on that role, particularly your work with women in STEM. I know and I see from all the um, publicity around your work, that you do the good steady work visiting with schools and universities, which you have to do, you have to wear out the shoe leather. But do you have any comment upon that? I think that is where someone like myself as an advocate in government, university leaders, your leader in science and technology, APSI, um, can actually combine with a strong argument in pointing out there is more alignment than traditionally we have been able to establish. Thank you. Right. Um... Thanks, Minister. That's uh, that's a really thought-provoking thought question, actually, because one of the things that's really interesting, coming into um, this role, I sort of had kicked myself for having been in CSRA for 36 years, because you have a very limited view of the world. You think you know everything, but you don't know what's beyond your, 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 your realm of understanding. And, uh, and what I found really interesting was coming in um, where I'm in a you know, department of in industry, science, energy and resources, DISA in, in the Commonwealth government. And it was really interesting to see how, um, how information is taken and used and what the process is and how decisions are made. And also what, um, what use, quality advice is when you present it in a way that is able to be used. So it's not, here's a you know, 10 page, or a 100 page document. It's actually something which is two pages, which is really putting the high level information out, which for many researchers is really hard to do because we love the detail. And, and, and I'll give you an example at the moment. One of the things I'm struggling with is, uh, you know, Australia, and particularly New South Wales and Sydney, has world leading and um, quantum research. We've been investing in it for many decades. And it's one where it's going to be the big disruptor. Every one of you will have a mobile phone soon that will have quantum key distribution or random number generations, which are based on quantum algorithms and things. It will become part of, we do logistics, um, it, the way the railways in New South Wales will run will be based on quantum. And, uh, you know, by health diagnoses, it, it will be, the, you know, sort of the next quantum revolution with like transistors and lasers have created um, since World War II. So it's great. We've got wonderful people and we've got extraordinary support, both in, um, with all the jurisdictions and the states and territories, as well as Commonwealth. 
but the disconnect between the researchers when they're trying to talk about their work, they immediately love going into all the all the details of having bras and kits and uh, Hamiltonians and all the sorts of things which uh, those who are really deep into it think are really critical, but able to lift things up to a higher level is something which we haven't, I think, brought our researchers to understand that it's almost like you have to have the first two lines of your nature paper is the bit that sort of says, why bother? And, and getting uh, the ability for researchers to understand how their work, regardless of whether it's uh, astronomy, which has been really critical in Australia. It's a major investment with the SKA as an example. Uh, uh, we've got you know, world leading uh, uh, um, radio astronomy and astronomy in general. We've got Nobel Prize winners in the area. And yet astronomy is something which has led to pushing the boundaries on instrumentation, which has led to things like Wi-Fi and better electronics. And, and, and so those big science experiments really are not only expanding knowledge, but expanding ways of doing things. And, but getting that recognition of how their research, researchers, our research fits into the system is something we've not been good at uh, because it's been a fairly um, siloed way of thinking about things. But that is changing. And that's the thing which I'm finding really exciting at the moment. There is not a single university or a single government, um, government uh, re publicly funded research organization that is not thinking about the impact of their research, even if it's impact in terms of uh, something which is breakthrough science, they recognize it's also got other impacts in inspiring young people to want to have STEM careers or, um, or leading to uh, what are they called spillovers or something, which is looking at things which are unintended outcomes, which lead to massive changes. Imagine if we'd have uh, a pandemic without Wi Fi or without digital capability of connecting on, on, on it would have been a disastrous world at that stage. And yet that's something that came from it. And, and, I, and the thing is interesting, if you look at the history of Wi-Fi, the people who were doing it, it wasn't something that just accidentally fell off an idea. It was actually uh, saying, this is great stuff we've got in radio astronomy. Can we use it for this area? Because we know there's a problem here, of, you know, being able to do wireless things and separate out the different information. And it was purposefully done. And I think quite often we have these myths that sort of suggest that uh, there's no, when fundamental work happens and things pop out from it, it's like magic or accidental, when in fact people know exactly how it can be used and they actually navigate it. Another example is, of course, World Wide Web, um, you know, sharing information um, uh, um, digitally, which we use at our fingertips every day, came from the um, uh, from the particle accelerator and all the work done in um, at CERN, and um, and that was be because I want to be able to share information with worldwide um, network of scientists working on it. But it's not as though that just morphed. It actually came from saying this is something useful and let's take it through a commercial process. And what we're seeing now is the university sector is really looking at this and, and adding to their long list of things they're expected to deliver on, educating our young people to be, you know, the, in the careers that are needed, uh, research discovery, as well as being, in many cases, um, e economic stimulation exercise hubs, uh, which is being um, expected as well. And we're seeing them stepping up to that challenge. So I think we're in a state of flux um, Minister, so that we're seeing, we're going to, we're seeing young people coming in thinking, when I do my university degree, uh, I'm not just going to be a person working in a laboratory. I actually want to start my own business. I want to create my own prosperity, and I, or I want to contribute to something where I see where my research fits in, even if it is um, something which seems like it's much more fundamental. So I think we're on a journey at the moment. I know it's a long-winded answer. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, we had a question just here. Yeah. And but by the way, before this question is asked, can you all get those little brains churning around online and in this room? So we've got yeah. hands going up everywhere. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Oh, Kathy, that was really amazing. I loved um, everything that you said. Love everything that you do. And I have to thank you. Um, for all the work that you're doing in schools and particularly to encourage um, girls at school. And I know you're the patron of ASI's Curious Mind. Oh, yes. And um, yeah, it, that's just an amazing program. It's fantastic to have you on the patron. So 
But my question actually is more in the area of uh, innovation and commercialization. And that has fascinated me. And it's only that you made that comment earlier in the talk about measuring digital mm -hmm. um, expense and economics. And it always amazed me that, you know, how do you in incorporate the productivity of, say, Google Maps into your work day? Mm. And I just wonder, yeah, do you have any comments about that? Because I think until we do that, I don't know how we're going to make this such an exciting area for the government, for society and for, for people. So the question was, if you're measuring, you need to measure things, how do you actually introduce the, the digital side of stuff? So, and that's, a, that's a probably $64 million question. Is and this is something that's being considered really deeply across all governments, businesses. Is you think digital that should be easy to measure? So, how, and I think uh, one of the things that's interesting is looking at the different vehicles that are currently used to be able to, uh, or instruments that are used to collect data. Um, I know we have a, a thing called the Government Science Group, which is uh, the chief scientists of all the public funded agencies that the Commonwealth funds. It's about 21 of them, just by the way, it's not just CSRO, ANSTO and DST. There's also the Bureau of Statistics, which does a lot of the collecting of this information. And, and David Groen's really been considering how do you actually do this along with the data um, commissioner as well. So, uh, and it's not as, and, and the thing is, it's not as though you just do a number and you can collect the data. You've got to work out how you can do it in a way which is um, collecting information that is seamless because we all know that when you ever do surveys, it's about, you're lucky if it's 20 to 60%, you never get the full lot. What would be great is the way where you've got some way of automatically clicking things over, but then you've got all the privacy issues and all the stuff that go with that. Um, and then you've also got to have something which is interoperable internationally. So you, the complexities are extraordinary. And, and this is, the fact that we're aware of it is step one. And so that's something we, we're, I'm really pleased to see. And there's a huge amount of work being done across the Commonwealth, looking at how to do this in different parts. And um, the thing which is interesting is how um, uh, the role I have is to link, link these up so that you're able to make sure that different parts of the system that are looking at these things are actually talking to each other. And we're seeing more and more of that happening with interdepartmental committees being set up and considering is knowing that this, these are hard nuts to crack. But, the, uh, and as I said before, the first one is saying you want to crack it. And then, and also be willing to, um, I, I guess it's going back to that whole risk thing. Where do you put your risk with things like privacy, uh, management of collecting information, cost as well, and, um, and not just relying on, on, on surveys, which uh, I think we're, that day has passed and we have to start thinking of different ways to do that. Another thing finally is also categorizing things. Quite often we link things up and we have a single number and that doesn't serve us well from whether it's national, um, normalized citation indices for, um, for research. Um, we've been just looking at work there. That, that is one where it's, it's just, um, it's too, too uh, blunt to do it that way. And I think we have got to a point where we've got this capability, digital capability in our, hand, in our hands that we need to be working out how we can um, get to a level of granularity, which isn't so so detailed that you can't make head or tail of the information, but enough detail to be able to differentiate the contributions that you lose when you lump it all together to a single average. Next question from Ashley. Thank you for a marvelous oration. Um, my question is, what are the barriers to open access research literature. And I asked this because there was an initiative called Awfully that took all the Australian legal information put it online. Um, what are the barriers for research to be online? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's this is a good example of evolution at its worst. Um, so if you think about when research publication started, um, several hundred years ago, and then it's and then it's only the idea of peer review is a more recent thing. Um, but but it's actually a, a interesting thing. When it was first set up, it was seen as a non-for-profit exercise where you uh, people were able to publish papers. They were put in libraries, and people were able to read those. Um, and um, in 2007, 2008, everything went digital, and the same business model was maintained. So you had subscriptions. 
and um, and so libraries pay subscriptions for things to be online and be able to be read by the people who are in their organizations. But then also there was this idea, since it's online, there was a desire to have more open access. And so there were a whole range of ways to say, this is, um, this is open access. So uh, some companies in time also became profit-making as different, uh, um, uh, different, and in fact, uh, I forget the person's name, Maxwell from, um, from uh, who brought together um, Pergamon Press and has created Elsevier, which is the biggest publisher uh, in, in the world. It, um, uh, they started moving towards it being a profit-making exercise. And um, research publishing has actually become the most profitable business in the world. And so therefore it's, uh, it's about a 40% margin, um, which just to give you a put in Google, which is one of the most profitable country, companies is 23% margin. So, and why is it so successful? It's because um, they get the information for free, which is from the public person research. So the, um, the peer review is done for free. The editorial work, which you know, I can't edit in chief of the journal, Superconductor Science and Technology, I'm sure you all read it, uh, for the Institute of Physics Press, um, that's um, that you get, a, as you're an editor, you get a, a, um, an honorarium, and I've worked out that it's about $2.50 an hour, if I like it, for the amount of work I do, um, uh, dealing with rejections and appeals and strategy and all that. And, um, and so it's so so the the publishers play a very important role. I don't want to diminish that, but the problem is that and they're very critical. But they they we've got an imbalance in the system. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we pay about three hundred and fifty million dollars a year in accessing research literature. Some of that is by paying subscription fees, and that's easy. We can go around and um, and potentially look at um, where all that money is being paid by the public person saying, well, can we bring it together as a single a single, um, a single, lot of money and then have one arrangement with each publisher. The problem is there's also an extra fee you can pay to make your work open access. And this can vary from, you know, about $2,000 is about the cheapest one to uh, up to $15,000 uh, for some of the high impact factor journals. And, uh, and we don't know who pays for that. We don't know whether the organisations do, people pay it for themselves. And we've also got to a point where citation, um, we're using citations as a major measure for excellence and ranking. And we're now realising that there is a uplift in your citations if they're gold open access, which means you pay to open access, as opposed to open access where it's in a repository in your organisation. And, um, and so that means our, our way of measuring excellence is suddenly going to be one we can't rely on too, which is a problem. So that's, that has to be fixed. So you can see there's a lot of stakeholders in the system and a lot of complexity. And, uh, and so that's where the complication comes from. What I'm getting so far is I've spoken to many, all the four big publishers, and uh, they're very excited by this. They think it's because the model I'm putting forward is one which is sustainable, knowing that publishers are important and they're an important part of the process. And we need to make sure they're funded in, and that they are businesses that need to make a level of profit, maybe not 40%. Then there's the thing of the way the system works. So how do we, I'm sure um, Andrew wouldn't be happy if I came along and said, I need to scrape some money off you because universities are, are struggling with funds as it is. And, um, and so therefore, how do you actually get that money together in the central pool? And then the other is also looking at um, how, how do we actually have um, the agreements with each of the publishers, if we have a central one. We've got four big publishers and they've got another 13 medium-sized publishers. And then we have about 25% of our research is published in uh, 1,060 publishers across the world. And that long tail is tricky too. So there's sort of the complexities there. Uh, it's really, um, I think there's a lot of ambition globally at looking at what we're doing because many open access models are not sustainable. And so we're looking at one which is trying to be simple, sustainable, and also taking it beyond just the academic realm, but making it so that research literature is available to all, so that you can get um, the nonsense online you get through uh, looking at Google or, or on, on whatever, you actually get the real stuff as well. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Susan Pond. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Kathy. You've already got an enormous job looking after science and technology. 
And you mentioned your committee of 21 chief scientists at agencies around the, around the country. But a lot of the things you've talked about, you have touched on a couple of times, mean that you need to bring society with you. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about how you approach this question of science and society to make it happen? Yeah, well, that's it's really interesting. One thing that I have been talking about, um, Oh, the question was how to bring in science society along with the um, with the whole process, and that's that's really a very critical part. And um, and that social license is absolutely critical. If we go back looking at um, where we've done well, such as IVF, that was some, something where it's quite disruptive and could be contentious, and we did that well. Look at uh, genetically modified foods; we probably didn't handle that as well. So we want to make sure we use the best practice. I think nanotechnology is another example where we've done really well, where you know we used to have our annual concern about nanoparticles in sunscreens. That's no longer an issue. Just by the way, all sunscreens have nanoparticles in them, even no nano ones. I did some work on that with the team. Because anyway, that being the case, one of the things which I've been talking about is the importance of science is just one bit. Uh, science on its own is actually not very useful to anyone. It's nice to read. It's interesting if it tickles your fancy. But science on its own is not helpful. What is helpful is, uh, or research, is the engineered outcomes that you turn it into something that's useful, that you have the um, social license so that you bring society with you, that you have to have the business model. If you look at things such as uh, new technologies that come on board from whether it's iTunes or Amazon Books on that, they were successful not just because of the science and the technology, but also they had a business model that really allowed them to engage into the commerce really well. Then you also have to have that um, human interface. So this design, language, you know, think about um, um, Steve Jobs went and to, uh, to calligraphy school, I think it was, to learn how to design his own, um, his own font so that you have the Apple font because, and it's very pleasurable to look at, you know, you like that. And those things are really important parts of being able to transition anything to something that people want to use. So that design and has you know, humanities, arts, social science interface is absolutely critical. And to be honest, I think often our physical sciences are not very, and, and health and medical research does not embrace HASS enough. And I work closely with the academies of social science and, um, and HASS as well, because I see them as absolutely the critical pathway to this, um, to us getting this um, social um, acceptance and license in what, in what I think are important ways forward. But the thing is, you've also got to listen when they're saying, I'm not sure we're ready for that yet. And so how do you actually navigate it? So you know, GMO foods is a good example. It's now something which doesn't seem to have quite the sensitivity that had in the past, but also meant there's a lot of time when um, when things were had to be hybridized rather than going directly to, to genetic modification because we didn't, we didn't navigate that right. And so uh, I think this is something that's critical for all of us, especially in um, an academy like APSI, where uh, we're looking at the technology and the engineering and the impact. That's really critical that we partner with the humanities to make sure that we actually do that as e in equal parts, because we can have the best solution in the world, but if it's not one that we have the social acceptance to. My role in that is basically going through and raising this all the time. That's the first thing, making sure that, and this includes also building on Indigenous knowledge as well, making sure that anything I'm involved with brings on board the social sciences and the advice from them, getting just the same level of peer-reviewed advice into that. And for example, when we did a, a rapid response information question uh, for the government last year relating to something to uh, the pandemic, we actually got the best advice from the social scientists, which really helped government at the time. And that was able to give them a you know, really good um, uh, way of navigating uh, public acceptance uh, at that time of, of things they were struggling with. And, um, and so that's, that's something which I'm doing as an everyday part is looking at every project I'm doing is, and, and quantum is a really good example, is making sure that you don't end up with people getting scared by it overwhelmed by those of us who love tech head stuff and really excited by pushing the boundaries and you know uh, spooky distant action at a distance all that sort of stuff and most people are saying you're hiding under the table saying is this the end of the world as we know it 
And these are the things where you have to really think about what are the communications, how is researchers, and it goes back to Ganella's question too about not only measuring things, but how do you actually make sure that you are, um, are able to uh, bring everyone along and realize that all of us, it doesn't matter what job you're in, is going to have to have a level of the science and technology, digital capabilities, just like everyone has to use a computer now and everyone uses a mobile phone. We're going to have to you know, take this society with us and we have to invest in that and, and make sure it's part of every project we do. We have one here, then I think it's Peter Rockton at that table, then Professor Fells here and I'll go, I'll go by the next one, Katie, any? Hi, Kathy. Thank you so much for your mentoring and support to me in my previous role at VDF Project. So uh, I observed that in the last uh, at least the 20 odd years that uh, the science and the uh, discipline boundary become so I mean, become a lot more blurry. Mm. Take example, of course, my lab is in AI with many computer science. In this one, so uh, we're not only looking at the traditional computer science model, but also looking to the real life problems like the tech infrastructure, maintenance, geometry, buildings, tracks, water pipes, gas pipes, etc. So, my question is in this kind of a uh, uh, getting a uh, merging of blurry, uh, blurry kind of uh, approach in the innovation, how we can encourage multidisciplinary approach, like uh, from you know, uh, civil engineering, uh, mm -hmm. typical computer science, we come from uh, simple uh, engineering, and we're working with computer scientists, uh, as you know, as well, they have to be as you know. and also working with the very different industry uh, sectors. It's the same type of technology, mm. right? So that are easy to predict and uh, predict the maintenance of rail tracks versus uh, some, you know, mining engines and uh, some gas pipe. The technology on the foundation is very similar. How can we, you know, have a champion those kind of discussions? Yeah, so the question was interdisciplinary work, both in research as well as in industry, and how can we get the same technologies can be used in different places, but they're not necessarily knowing that they're doing that, prevent reinventing wheels and creating. So, um, so look, that's a really important question because uh, I think we have an opportunity at the moment. You know, we've found that COVID and doing things online has opened up the opportunity for, I think, stronger communication. So we're all really comfortable now getting people together on a moment's notice to be able to be around a Zoom meeting and be able to share information, which maybe in the past would have required airplane travel, organizing, catering, booking a room and all that sort of stuff. I actually think that this is the starting point for us to actually see much more of that interdisciplinary approach. But the issue is going to be how do we actually measure that when we've got the system set up, you know, into uh, even from whether it's a you know government agency like CSIRO where I was at, you have different business units, which um, how you have those what I call the horizontals and linking them up, and how do we recognise and reward those? Um, I know, um, sorry to say, Sydney University, and I think I don't know if you might have it too, Andrew is. Um, and I know RMIT has this too, where they're beginning to set up, and this probably happened lots of unis, but these are the ones I know, these institutes that go across where they're, th they're themed again around things. So Sydney University had their NO Institute, which I, I know well, because I had the great pleasure of reviewing it. And it was something where I was just jumping out of my chair, just seeing the creativity of the projects by having someone in medicine, talking to someone in physics, talking to someone in, in chemistry and someone talking in engineering and pulling together these multidisciplinary projects and doing things with a shoestring, but you know, they got a couple of thousand dollars to, you know, sort of um, do a, some, some initial project work that then led to amazing solution of questions. So it's, you know, sort of problem seeking because multidisciplinary work usually comes from people saying, I want to solve a problem. And so it's, it's much more end in mind approach and so I don't know how the sector, say the research sector manages those horizontals because we're not sort of, we're set up to look at things in a vertical way. And that's where we go back to, you know, are we measuring things the right way? Have we got the right um, 
uh, incentives in place. And uh, and I, I think that we're seeing the beginnings of that. And I imagine that many universities ha have that approach. I know in, in, uh, in say, CSRA, they've got these horizontal communities of practice as well. And they had those, you know, you know they, one stage they had flagships and things, as you know. But they're always tricky because the management of them are really, really hard. And that's because communication is, is the tricky bit. And then I guess in industry, it's the same thing, you know, water industry talking into the rail industry. Um, yeah, sort of, and, and maybe that's where, that's the role maybe for us, you know, like ATSI is, a, is sort of saying, you've got a multidisciplinary industry base here. Maybe that's a role for ATSI to start bringing together um, these disparate groups. I know we've got the different, I should know the structure of ATSI. What are the different things? We've got the water group and the water. Forums, yes, and maybe you need to have interdisciplinary forum events to uh, say what have we got to share and how do we actually consider that, and that and sort of start really pushing the, that opportunity because uh, you're right, you go it's hard enough getting industries together in an industry, let alone trying to get industries across different pathways. But one of the things that I've noticed is that once you know, it's all about human interactions. Once you realise that you know you've got something to talk about, people talk and follow up. And, um, and then that's where the role of government is, is to make sure that there's incentives or there's support there to make, you know, degrees of wheels so that the, the things can happen. And that's why they have things like, you know, uh, collaboration hubs and the things that bring people together or, or, you know, sort of industry events. So there's the there sorts of things which we need to do and fan the flame of things that are happening and working, but we also have to make sure that the rewards and recognition for people to do that are in place so that it's not just people doing it at the expense of them losing out on their other career aspects. So, so it's tricky. I'm not going to pretend I've got a solution for everything. Thank you. Oh, Kathy, uh, Peter Rockland. Um, I want to go back to basics because something that really upsets me is the, um, and I've got three boys, but none of their friends, you said, my son, who got the math prize at school, um, seemed to, to be doing STEM subjects, and this goes right back, and, and I can only go back to when I was 15 and flip the mathematics teacher who was brilliant and, and made me fall in love with maths and become an engineer. Um, so all this that you're talking about is, is mostly predicated on people being able to do those sort of things. Can you and your position or your institutions or your influence increase the percentage of people in schools who are doing um, STEMs? Well, I didn't pay him to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> that's actually something that's very, very concerning is that if you think we've got uh, 20,000 jobs coming up in space by 2030, we've got 8,000 jobs in hydrogen, we've got 16,000 jobs coming up in quantum, and we've got 250,000 jobs in AI needed in two years time. We graduate what about three thousand AI graduates a year across Australia. So that, and we we haven't normally we in, bring in about two hundred fifty thousand people as skilled migrants every year, and that hasn't happened for the last two years. And we'll take some time to ramp up because uh, everyone's got skills shortages across the world. So you've identified a huge issue. Um, I'll just give you one other concerning factor, and that is if you look at the New South Wales. Um, a, 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 HSC numbers of kids doing subjects, which I look at with great interest every year. And New South Wales is the only, only state that actually really um, publishes quickly their data on, um, on numbers of kids doing different subjects. And the number, of, and I'm using physics because I'm a physicist, but it's also, uh, and I've been keeping an eye on it for decades, but it's, um, it's also, I think, a canary in the coal mine in some ways. Um, so it's had about, um, 9,000 kids doing physics across New South Wales in the HSC every year. Last year, it dropped to 8,000 in one year. And so that's really, really concerning. And then, um, and we also are seeing that, I know I, I trained to be a high school teacher and all my friends who I did uh, my Department of Education with, they are all retiring. And uh, we don't actually have the number of teachers coming through the system who are trained to teach, and we're, we're actually having to see too many teachers teaching out of area, and that's something which is a challenge. Um, I think we've seen an uptick in respect for teachers as a consequence of COVID. I think anyone who tried to teach their children at home have a whole new respect for the teaching profession, 
which is great and we should fan that flame and, and really lift up the respect for teachers because I'm a not a teacher for a really good reason. Uh, because I just found, you know, I, I'm half from loving research. It's actually a really hard job and it's a hugely responsible job. And I think we don't give it the credit, possibly the pay packet that goes with it. Um, and, and so, uh, and the other is also for most kids, now that I'll give you one other piece of information. And that is there's some work done some years ago by Rose and Rose. I don't know who they are, but they're, they're obviously a husband and wife team who, um, who uh, did research looking at GDP versus interest in, um, in science and technology. And it's a linear relation, the higher the GDP, the lack of interest in school students with, um, with science and technology. And, uh, and so we're a high GDP country. And so that means that our, our school students, kids think that you know, technology comes from a shop, I don't care where, um, milk comes from the refrigerator. Uh, you know, feed your by at McDonald's. So that is something where they're, 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 even though we have you know, a spectrum of, of advantage and disadvantage in the country, on average, everyone is pretty advantaged here compared to many developing countries. So there's not that incentive where you know, low GDP, GDP countries see um, science and technology as a way out of poverty. So with all that background, um, if you ask a kid at school in year 10, what do you want to be when you grow up? They will not say, I want to be a scientist. Or they might say, you know, the nerdy kid will, but, but they'll change their mind by the time they get to year 12, because if they're really smart, they'll do medicine or law. And, um, and if you go through and ask them, so what does a scientist do? Where they, then parents will jump in and say, oh, I don't do science, there's no jobs. Oh, don't do engineering because, uh, you know, it's not really clear what you do. You end up having to work in the middle of Australia or something in a coal mine. So it's things where um, this, what I call STEM career pathways is really hidden. And most uh, people in the school system do not realize that there are, and probably many of you don't realize either, that our future as an economy is not on the, the economy we have today. It's on a knowledge-based economy. And we need to make sure we're growing our own um, knowledge base and our own career pathways. And our, um, and our own career young people so that we don't end up with them doing the service stuff and we import all the uh, people who do the uh, knowledge based and uh, industry or work. And this is, so I'm doing, I've got, uh, the Prime Minister is very concerned about this and uh, through his National Science and Technology Council, uh, we've got a project which we're starting now on uh, STEM career pathways. And the idea is to really be disruptive on this and sort of, uh, you, know, you probably gathered that I'm one for pushing the boundaries a bit and saying we cannot just do, you know, count the numbers and, and you know, feel sad that we're not got enough people doing STEM and subjects in high school. I've actually got to do something and work out what do we need to do that's disruptive to make a difference. And uh, this project is a big project. It's, um, it'll be um, completed by the end of the year. We're just kicking it off now. It's um, and it's one which uh, I hope all of you will help me with because we really have to figure out how do we, uh, and what are the roadblocks that are stopping us from young people and their parents recognizing that their future and everybody of course wants their children to be successful. They want them to be able to pay their own bills, have happy lives and be um, prosperous and, and, and enjoy a life of well-being. And so we have to make sure that they, everyone can see that that's the pathway to achieve that. And at the moment they don't. Uh, Pro Professor Chris Fells is going to ask a question now, but I, I want to just do one very quick thing. Kathy has introduced a topic about a uh, previous chief scientist, Dean Chubb, said industry did not come to the fore and pick up any of these incentives in what I'm going to say commercialising R&D and IT in Australia. Chris Fells and, dare I say, Professor Chaikin, ahead of him or before him, one of, one of a number of Australians that saw how commercialisation could take place, in Chris's case, that's in water technology or filtration. And I think that there, there needs, Cathy, to be, and let's not try to invent it today, but I think that Chris and others in this room are able to help solve uh, Ian Chubb's problem by using what he did once and what we know Professor Tyken did. Would you like to have the floor? Oh, can I have my question? <laughs> 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 
friend, Mr. Peter Bickle, he happens, every kid wants to become an entrepreneur and earn a swing and have a house on the harbour or buy a company. Uh, it's just infecting him with that enthusiasm. But Kathy, thank you again for a very inspiring address. I guess as a detractment observer, I'd say Australia faces a fairly interesting future, a fairly scary one, geopolitical, environmental. I just wonder if we've got the national research authorities right, given the current situation. I'm very conscious that it's a role for chief scientists to actually set lead. So I want you thinking about where we're at now and where we should go. So I've been asked the question of our national research priorities and whether I should be setting them and are they the right ones. Well, actually, I'm not the one who sets them. I, make, I don't do anything. I just make recommendations. So my job is uh, the Kim Kardashian of science. I am the influencer of government with <laughs> evidence-based information that hopefully will allow... <laughs> anyway, so just to, so to get that right. But the next thing is that... Um, that look, these were reviewed in 2017, and uh, it looks like, and they were set up, the current ones by Ian Chubb, uh, I think in 2012 or thereabouts. And so it, normally in the, in, the, in the cycle of a chief scientist, they are, are considered. And, um, and so it would be making sense, of course, that I'll be looking at those during my term. It's one where uh, I have to be invited to do that um, by the government. It's not one which I, I can, you know, again, suggest that, but it's one which has actually been invited by... by it's one which I think it's, it's important to always re, 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 look at them and make sure that they're relevant for today. Absolutely. It, we should always be challenged. We should always be challenging the things we use as our, as our, our signposts and, and, and revising them if they need to be, and you go through that process. I don't want to pretend I know whether they're right or wrong. Uh, it served us well to now. That was what um, the re review that um, that Alan Finkel did, I think it was in 2017, said that they were fit for purpose. They're very high level. And what you're seeing is that the government has actually um, gone through and gone down a uh, you know, research digit number couple so that they're focused down on things like modern manufacturing. The world changed. Well, the world has changed. And also, um, I think we're seeing uh, a real change in what we need to do as a nation in terms of things like we, we were, you know, we've gone away from a global world. You know, we had global supply chains, and you can buy. You don't have to worry about doing things because you can get it cheaply from somewhere else. I think what we're seeing is a world now where um, we're moved away, moving away from that. So our current supply chains, where we buy a whole lot from one country, um, is no longer seen as um, something which is not just sustainable, but it's adored. And so uh, there's a whole lot of geopolitical uncertainty around the world, and not just in the countries we know about today, but in some of our, our, our biggest allies as well, have got, um, got um, unrest in their countries as well. And so we need to uh, really make sure that we understand where the risks are. And there's a lot of work being done on supply chain um, security. And then what does that, when we understand what they are, and I think we would have seen the critical technologies that has, that list that the government's put out, that will be guiding us to understand what are, you know, what, what are the things we have to be really uh, careful of and make sure that we've got access to regardless of what's happening, what's happening around the world. A really good example of that is semiconductors. New South Wales um, government's got a really good program which they're setting up a semiconductor sector um, uh, uh, bureau to be able to uh, be a, which is very exciting and I think going to be a game changer. And then the, that links into a whole lot of other things that are happening, whether it's quantum. And, and so I think we're seeing a real shift in the way we're thinking about things. Plus, the need to get to zero emissions um, will, will will change the um, business models as well. So that in, we, you know, talking about premium price for wool by having you know, certain sorts of qualities, we'll be looking at premium prices for being able to show that you've got zero emissions in the way you're producing, that you have low environmental footprint. And that's where we've got to position our industry to make sure that they are on that pathway so that they're globally competitive by being, you know, in thinking about their emissions and their environmental footprint, about where the supply chains are and what the opportunities are. And these things, yeah, so they've got all these things coming together 
that's why I'm not writing in saying now's the time to review the, um, the, the national research priorities, only because there's a lot of movement at the moment. And I just feel now's not quite the right time. I'd like to see things just settle a little bit. It may never, and you might have to decide to do something later when it's not settled. But <laughs> at the moment, I just think that it's too much. There's a few too many things which are changing too fast to know whether we set them right and then a week later they're all wrong. Thank you. We, we've got two more and then we're finishing. Uh, Andrew first and then Iman over here. Uh, and we, we've got to watch the time because we are always punctilious. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kathy. Very stimulating as usual. Um, the, the, the comment, I'm happy for you to take money off the, the fix the copyright system. Oh, and, and, that's and, uh, I'll give you that, that challenge. Uh, but uh, look, measuring, Is this recorded? That's great. <laughs> measuring what matters. Well, we've been at it for yeah. two years now. Yeah, um, measuring what matters, I think, is really important. Um, but giving people confidence that what matters is going to stay relatively um, mm -hmm. in view mm -hmm. for a, a career um, and in a global context is a real challenge. So I, I, there are no easy answers here, but for, um, for good academics, um, how can we give them confidence for policy sets that uh, the new things that we want to measure um, are things that are going to be important for them across mm -hmm. the career and in a global context where Good academics and good science is inherently global, mm -hmm. um, and people are seeing and measuring the same thing. How do we address that sort of challenge? And it's probably not either or, it's probably uh, a mix of, of everything. Yeah. You, you, you picked your, so the question was how do we make it so they're enduring and globally interoperable, I guess. Really important question, and it's, and th this is something where um, the chief scientists of the world get together. And we actually have a club of uh, the chief scientists from UK, US, um, New Zealand, Canada, and Australia. Uh, we actually uh, get together, and this is one of the questions we're looking at, is, a, is actually a global concern about research metrics. So it's not just us, surprise, surprise. A, a lot of countries are worried, particularly about the, uh, in the, the, the way that the um, different um, international rankings of universities are driving certain things in, in universities, which they have to do if they want to be competitive, there's actually a global concern that it's, is that actually leading to best outcomes in research and also best outcomes for careers and best outcomes so that universities are sustainable as well. So, um, so this is something which is going to, is on the agenda with our chief, global chief scientists. And so that's a, a, a subgroup and then there's a bigger group which has got lots of chief scientists. So that, that means that anything you do, you, of course you wanna do it as a international approach. And that's what my thinking is. The other is also you've got to design them so that there is um, at least for a decade, you know, for a, as you say, um, at the moment, if you think about when we started at uni, no one really worried about impact factors or anything like that. It was a case of uh, getting a paper published, it's more volume, I guess, um, and even then not that much. Um, so the metric stuff is actually quite a recent, recent thing. Uh, we can thank Mr. Garfield for the impact factors and Hirsch, is it, for, he's a superconducting physicist, by the way, uh, for the H factor. And these are really blunt tools and they were designed for different purposes to how they're being used. And, uh, but again, they're really easy, you know, easy to, you know, we've got systems where you can collect the information and press a button and up comes a number which allows you to rank things. When you, you know, you know what it's like, you've got a big pile of things you've got to assess and you've got to go through and you pick a couple of your favorite key things to really try and rank people. And as your first pass, put them in the A, Bs and C pile. And then you don't worry about the A's because you think you're all good. The C's, you put them in the B, but the B's you spend your time on. And that's a you know, pretty universal approach to, to dealing with things. And I think we've got to a point where we need to think about what are the different components that need to be considered. And I actually think we'll, we'll see other things come in. And this is a, particularly for um, women in science aspect is that um, mentoring, having, and you know, I'm, no one picked up the the mentor, it was my Harry Potter um, <laughs> reference. But anyway, um, that we actually have a system which has got a lot of bullying in people who are very successful researchers. I guess some of you know that because we've got a system that rewards people who tread on their heads of others to get where they need to go to and don't necessarily look after the people that, that they've used. 
And so mentoring, if we were to have a mentoring um, requirement, how you do that, you'd have to think about it so it's not gamed and all that. So I'm not going to pretend these are simple things, but had a, had a way of considering that. If you had a way of, um, uh, this is something that um, Adrian Turner, who used to be the head of um, Data61, uh, he had this idea of tokenization, where you actually, if you are, um, president of something or you're uh, uh, organize a, um, a conference or you on a zillion committees or whatever, you actually have a formal way of getting a token which actually allows to be considered so that that extracurricular stuff, which you know we know the, the world goes uh, functions, especially in the research sector on, on um, people having volunteer contributions. And those volunteer contributions are not considered. And, Anyone who's an editor of a journal will know that fewer and fewer people want to referee papers because they're too busy doing their research. But um, you know, how do you actually tokenize that so that it's? Um, but you also don't want to get to a point where people then overdo that and not do you know, getting that balance. So they're the sorts of things which we've got great social scientists who psychologists who know about these things, and that's I'm talking to them all the time about this because they're going to be the pathway forward. And as I, it's and it's not an overnight success story here. This is one where uh, I think we have to think about that whole the whole system, and it is an ecosystem thing. We've also got to work out how to how do you actually assess someone who's been like Genevieve Bell, who you know, worked in Intel and you know, changed the world as we know it. How does she get whatever her tokens are so that she's competitive in IRC, for example? Thank you. So our last um, question from a. Uh, quickly, uh, a, a man who has presided over a hundred million dollars worth of research being commercialized right now. Kathy, uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for the incredible work you have been doing, impacting positively uh, in many ways our lives globally. Uh, my name is Imad Hamad. I'm the chief executive of Australia Renewable Energy Corporation, ARICOR. We are a system house solution provider providing clean green energy base load at the lowest levelized cost of energy and the lowest uh, greenhouse gas footprint globally. And we're very active not only in Australia but in developing nations to make the impact. In my lifetime, I've witnessed many wars. Uh, humanity spent about six trillion dollars in Iraq and we were not able to bring democracy, human rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, and so on and so forth. We spent about $2 trillion in Afghanistan, and yet to see those rights um, coming to life. My question to you is, how is in your opinion, we could collectively as a society inspire men and women to direct not billions of dollars for research, but enough to create a passion and get something positive out of the R&D instead of the sadness of destructive war. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just trying to summarize the question. So, uh, so we spend a lot of money on def on on war and on defense expenditure. How can we actually uh, see if we can change the way we think about ourselves in a societal way to be able to uh, have more positive uh, impact by by doing research that leads to positive outcomes as opposed to the negative to do war and, and stuff that goes with, it, especially since it doesn't seem to work anyway. Yep. Okay. Easy question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have the answer to that. I won't pretend I do. But look, I think the first thing is as a research sector, we, we need to get better at making the case. And I think we're getting better at making the case. Um, we've got to get people who are willing. Um, and it'd be really interesting to hear from our minister today is saying it's a big deal for someone to give up their life and, and to become a parliamentarian. I have enormous respect for our parliamentarians because uh, so, you know, I've always seen, you know, it's, it's, it's a thankless task, oh, oh, thank you, uh, <laughs> because it's not only do you have to come and deal with the everyday things, but you also have to deal with your electorate, you have to deal with your party, you have to raise money and that sort of stuff. So it's a huge job and it's one which usually has personal impact on people and we see that because unfortunately too much personal life of our parliamentarians ends up 
deciding where their futures are, which I think is terrible and shouldn't shouldn't even be in the newspapers. But um, and so I can understand why a lot of researchers don't want to become parliamentarians. But you know that's that's one thing is actually putting your hand up and leaning into actually being willing to be considered. I mean, it's, it's a process you've got to be elected to, but you can be elected. So that's one, another thing. And then, yeah, that making the case though is something which I think is only new for most researchers. I think we have had a bit of a culture in many countries of entitlement. I'm a researcher, give me money, I'll do good stuff. I'll publish a paper and that's the end of it. I think we've seen an extraordinary shift and it was really interesting. Someone was saying from 2001, I think it was or something, the, about industry. I think since 2016, we've had a massive change in the country where uh, we're just seeing people thinking, researchers thinking about how can I turn my research into something? And who would have thought that, you know, universities were churning out huge numbers of um, entrepreneurs who are starting up their own businesses and thinking about how can I take my research to doing something like that, which is positive. And, um, and I, I think the, I, from experience, my focus on the positives and ignore the negatives. You do that with your kids. Maybe we need to do that globally with, you know, sort of, yes, we have to manage, you know, the fact that there's horrible things happening in the world at the moment, but also fanning the flame of um, the positives, really pushing them forward is, is, is really all that, that is in our power, I think, apart from maybe some of you putting your hand up to be um, elected as parliamentarians and bringing in that wealth of science, engineering and business into, the, into, the, into our, into our um, governance places. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Cathy. Thank you, Cathy. Yeah. Um, thank you, Cathy. That was a ruling Q&A. Um, and we would, I'd like to invite Dick Kell, past chair of Cardinal, to come and give us a lot of thanks quickly. Um, yes, uh, that, um, uh, Cathy, that was inspirational. Um, not just the delivery, but uh, the questions and the answering of the questions. I don't know whether your contract indicated that you would be grilled for that length of time, but you did very well. And uh, I can see why you're known as the Kim Kardashian of science, which uh, I think that might stick with you. Uh, I, should, I should mention that um, in the acknowledgements, it is the 10th uh, year anniversary of the Chaikin uh, uh, Racin, and we're so pleased to have uh, members of uh, Malcolm's uh, family here. But it is also, and having regard to your antecedents, it is also St. Patrick's Day, and it is, as an old bridge engineer, I have to say it's a 90 year anniversary of the opening of the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I should put that on record. I, th I think your, your topic um, uh, of uh, research and education in STEM was most appropriate given uh, Malcolm Chaikin's absolute commitment over so many years to education and to research. Uh, that was most appropriate and you, you brought him in um, to the, um, uh, in, in his contribution to the uh, wool industry. I, I do note that, um, that in your early research as a physicist, you, you worked on a conductor called indium nitride, is that correct? Yes, yes. And this, this has an application in low energy household lighting. So we at home uh, have the benefit of Cathy's early um, work in bringing light to us at home. And she brought light to us here in this uh, presentation. How neat is that? <laughs> um, and as um, our chief scientist, someone with who is clear talking and, and uh, uh, a clear vision. Um, we, we did have one previous chief scientist in, in my recollection deliver the Chaika narration. That was Alan Finkel, but I'm not sure that Alan was the chief scientist at the time. No, he wasn't. So you are a first there. You, you reminded us that politics and science have a relationship in the three R's, reactive risk and responsiveness. And you pointed out that science is a matter of try, try again. I, I think that's 
something that uh, we should keep in mind that science doesn't always get it right the first time, but eventually it will. And, and you, you mentioned, as I said, uh, Malcolm's work in the wool industry and the, the, the fact that the quality or the, or the grading quality could be measured made a huge difference to that industry. And therefore, that's an example of how important measurement is. And you kept coming back to that theme of having the right metrics and, and, uh, and being able to measure and therefore take action. So you then pose the question, how to measure innovation, how to measure academia and academic achievement, how to measure universities. Citations, do citations, they should be measured on the basis of advancement of science, perhaps in some way. And, and um, you know, that, that's correct. In, in my field of uh, civil engineering, we, um, uh, we, we now uh, measure what we're doing and, and it is not just how much concrete and how fast it is, but the social impact and the environmental uh, protections that we build into projects are uh, uh, strictly monitored and uh, strictly measured and monitored and, and engineers realize um, as much as or, or even more than any others that, that you must be able to measure in order to uh, properly deliver. The, um, uh, and and you, you made the, the comment that STEM I noted it down, it is uh, present in every aspect of our lives. Science is everywhere, you might say. And, uh, and I think that that is important to note. Uh, you um, dealt with the, oh, and I like the, um, the suggestion that all school kids should have quantum science in their backpack. Yeah, I'm going to speak to my grandchildren about that. And, and the importance of mentoring and and then how to grow the STEM workforce because clearly as you pointed out the jobs of the future are going to be STEM jobs uh, that's inevitable and and the uh, and one way of doing it is of course is to address the huge imbalance uh, the gender imbalance in the, um, the science in the STEM uh, area of, of uh, education we need to build the pool, as you said, and we need metrics to measure what we're doing and whether we're succeeding in that regard. So in, um, and to de develop metrics that are useful and practical. So in, um, uh, to just uh, conclude, you made the point, I like this, the time has come to be disruptive. We cannot stand still and uh, we must develop our ideas. And I thought that the, your open access system for research outcomes uh, has huge promise. And, and I believe that uh, that's something that the academy, for instance, could get behind and shake up the status uh, quo and take risks, but manage the risks. And I think that's a very neat way to conclude the address because, again, managing risks, uh, but it's a very, very, very neat way because that described Malcolm Chaikin's outlook. He shook up the status quo, he took risks and he managed the risks and he developed um, uh, great outcomes as a result. I think that um, we can all, I think you'd all agree with me that um, we have an outstanding chief scientist. Uh, we are um, most grateful for that. I, I'm sure that you will take the opportunities in the, your time in the role uh, to build uh, science in a very powerful way in Australia. And, um, and we thank you very much for that. And I would ask you all to join with me and to thank Kathy. So oh, thanks again, Kathy. That was really, it's truly really inspiring. Um, it's just to bring our webinar to a close. Um, and I want to thank also the organizers and technical staff at ATSI and the Union Club and to all of you for attending this really interesting event. So thank you very much for that. And I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you.